Spring 1918, the English help front is barely 80 kilometers from Doulan. The French with their alliés are holding it well. Ludendorff, now relieved of the Russian front, is preparing a German offensive. The first days of March are relatively cold. On the 21st of March, the Germans begin the assault. At 9.40 am, 200,000 soldiers attack. 6,200 cannons bombard British lines every 10 meters over the 19 kilometers front line. By evening, front line is broken in two places, direction Peron and direction Ham. The 22 Germans continue to advance. The 23, they advance further. Field Marshal Haig demands Pétain, whose troops are south of the Somme, to send reinforcements. Events, however, move faster than troops. Perron falls. At 4 p.m., Pétain and Goff meet in Dury. Whereas they thought three divisions would be sufficient, they now need 20. By morning, they would need 30 divisions to defend Amiens. Anglo-French relations are strained. The politics of self-interest are apparent. Meanwhile in Paris, Foch demands that Clemenceau create a commander-in-chief position. Every minute would count. The 24th, French reinforcements move north, throwing themselves into battle and of their position and their ultimate target. That evening, Pétain and Haig meet again in Dury. The Alliés are divided and their front line has collapsed. The 25th, Bapom is in enemy hands. Ludendorff orders his troops home. During the night, Germans take Albert and Noyon and are in sight of Roi. The 26th, the situation is desperate in the morning. The Alliés commanders meet in Doulan to formulate a plan. After some discussion, Foch is named Commander-in-Chief of Allied Troops. The end may not be in sight. As Commander, Foch now has the reserves at his disposal to allocate as required. He gives his orders. The nature of battle now changes. During the 26th, the Germans take their advantage and advance direction Amiens. The attack bypasses Albert and went deeper towards Doulan, which is less than 10 km from the front. Von Bulow attempts, without success, to take Villers Bretonneux in his drive towards Amiens. The 27th, Montdidier falls in the evening. Bosch has a simple plan. He will fight on all fronts. By hitting the Germans hard, he said, he hoped to beat them. He writes to Pétain on the 27th of March. There is not another meter of French ground to be lost. The enemy must be stopped where he is. Our troops must be held at all costs and keep their ground. Through Edmond's hands, German offensive continues to be felt. Despite the fall of Moreuil on the 30th of March, the German wave is halted. Positional warfare is no longer. For nine days, the Germans have been advancing and are dangerously close to Amiens. The Alliés resurrect the cavalry and the soldiers take to their horses to stop the Germans. March 30th, 1,200 Canadians are sent to Moreuil to retake woods occupied by the Germans. General Silly orders Lieutenant Gordon Flowerdrew to lead the charge. This is an extraordinary moment. I will not let you down. While the ground troops fight on foot, 
100 cavalry surround the woods to push back 300 Germans who fight as they retreat. Lower Duke cries. It's a charge, boys! Charge! Canadians' cavalry charge towards drawn into enemy machine gun fire. As horses are mowed down, cavalry dismount and continues the charge with bayonet and rifle. It's the most bloody battle. A soldier describes the moment as surreal. We hear the grunts of the wounded and nagging of dying horses. One did, Gordon Flowerjo would die the following day at the age of 33. He would receive posthumously the Victoria Cross. 350 Canadians and 800 horses fall on March 30th during the Battle of Moreuil. The cavalry will continue to fight despite the shelling. The woods will be liberated by the end of August. Sixty-eight years later, in 1986, a Moray citizen was wandering around the fields and discovered a shoe. Jean-Paul Brunel found out the body of a Canadian soldier. Je me promenais dans les champs, et puis, ici, à cet endroit précis, j'ai retrouvé une chaussure. Et dans cette chaussure, il y avait des os. L'année d'après, j'ai retrouvé là une, une, une baïonnette. Canadian. He shared this find and gathered his personal belongings. Years went by, and in 2008, a team of researchers and archaeologists went on the spot. Then, on the other end of the world, researches were beginning in Canada to try to find Caporal John James Willoughby, also named Jack's family. Here we are. We have uh, John Sr. Died October 30th, 1918, and they've also inscribed John's gravestone uh, in honor of Jack. Also, their son, J.J. Willoughby, who died for King and Country somewhere in France, March 30th. Jack Willoughby, aged 28, one of 13 children killed in action with the Canadian cavalry at Murray Wood. The trench detectives have tracked down his descendant, a car salesman from Rocky Mountain House, Alberta. The one thing I have that's been in the family for a long time and hung in my parents' home, and I'm now proud to have it, is a uh, portrait of Uncle Jack in his Royal Northwest Mounted Police uniform, uh, probably from about 1915 or so. And uh, from the stories from my father, we know that uh, he was in the Northwest Mounted Police and uh, joined up with the uh, Lord Strathcona's horse and was killed at uh, the Battle of Muriel Wood in France in 1918. And since then, really not sure where, where he is or uh, where he was buried. So after the war, Jack is listed as missing. But in 1986, a French farmer actually found Jack's body. He was, right? he was in the woods and he found Jack's body. Now, I have something to show you. I have two things to show you. Jean-Paul Brunel, who found the remains of Jack Willoughby and constructed the memorial, had sent artifacts that were found with the body. And I have a shoulder title, and that's Lord Strathcona's horse. Now, that spur and that shoulder title were found with Jack's body. Oh, you're kidding. My goodness. Isn't that something? So these yeah. are, went through the battle. Absolutely, wow. those were what he was wearing the day he was killed. Some weeks later, John James Willoughby, Jack's little nephew, went to Murray Wood for the first time with no clue what to expect. Who, who put up the the uh, memorial. The farmer, Jean-Paul. The farmer, Jean-Paul. Here was found on October 2nd, the body of John James Willoughby, of the C Squadron of the Lord Strathcona's Horse Regiment. He was killed in battle on March 30th, 1918, in the hero heroic charge at Morel Wood with many of his comrades. My goodness. Um, uh, that makes you very proud. He's taken the time and the and the effort and the honor to, 
to do this is, is very moving, very moving, very touching. Hmm. It's incredible. And, and right on this spot is where they found it. I, I, can't, I can't believe he's marked the area so extravagantly. Uh, huh. it was, and it was right on this spot where they found it. It's, no, I keep asking that question, but my goodness. Wow. Then he went to meet Jean-Paul Brunel, the man who found the soldier's body in 1986. Bonjour, Jean-Paul. Ouais. Jean-James Willoughby. Toi, Jean-Jean Willoughby. Oui. Tu es? De la famille de John Jam Willibi? Oui. C'est pas vrai. Oh! oh, oh. <laughs> Till uh, 1986. Hello. Having just met Jean Paul, his enthusiasm for uh, the history behind the Lord Strathcona's horse and, and particularly his interest in, in my uncle is, uh, is, is very over overwhelming. He's, uh, he's certainly very excited about it. I have to commend him on his. Uh, on the detail that he's gone into looking, it, it's so significant to, to, to actually find and, and, and see these artifacts that, that were found with, with Uncle Jack. The saber, the bayonet. Just, again, overwhelming. It's uh, to actually be able to see these items that were with him for so long, <clears throat> and there on the last day of his life. 350 soldiers and 800 horses lost their lives on March the 30th. Luckily, some of them survived, such as Tom Mackay. My dad uh, was uh, Tom Mackey, who was the uh, troop leader in the charge at uh, Maury Wood, uh, in the, uh, the first troop uh, in the Flower News Squadron. <laughs> Uh, there were uh, horses screaming and dying and men shouting, uh, bullets flying everywhere from all directions. And uh, when they charged the machine guns, uh, his, uh, his legs were uh, shot to hell. German reports say that of the 75 who charged, only three made it through their heavy machine gun fire. My dad got as far as the first line of Germans and his uh, horse was going down. It was dying on its feet and he was just able to uh, reverse his sword and fall on a German. And he was down on the ground. He was quite concerned he was going to get trampled to death, but he was able to uh, undo all his webbing and dropped his, uh, his holster and his uh, scabbard and his ammunition and so on and, and dragged himself along. Um, by grabbing tufts of grass. Today, on the 30th of March, 2018, exactly a hundred years after this tragic battle, we do not forget those who fought to defend Moray. We need to continue to honor the memory of those who battled, sacrificed themselves, those who suffered, so that we could live the freedom and live the life we know today. In memory of Canadian, English, Scottish, Australian and French soldiers, and in memory of all of the men who died for France between 1914 and 1918.